Let's move on to the complications of nephrotic syndrome. Generalized edema is a complication wherein the skin could have a, a breach and then secondary infection, etc. Scrotal edema is a complication in uh, young boys, male patients. And we all know that this happens because of a lot of sodium retention and decreased albumin. Hypercoagulability occurs due to presumed loss of inhibitors of coagulation in our blood. And venous thromboembolism is the sequel of this. Especially they get deep vein thrombosis in the calf muscles or they get renal vein thrombosis too. Hypercholesterolemia occurs in these patients and we'll have rampant atherosclerosis irrespective of the age of the patient. And they're prone to develop in infections, especially pneumococcal infections. This is due to the loss of protective immunoglobulins through the leaking glomerular basement membrane. Some percentage of patients do go into oliguric renal failure because of a decreased intravascular volume, which is causing hypovolemia and hypotension. Let's go to the management of nephrotic syndrome, wherein we broadly look into these four prongs of therapy. First is your duty is to establish the etiology or the cause, whether it's a primary nephrotic syndrome or a secondary nephrotic syndrome. You have to treat the cause if possible and you have to treat the symptoms irrespective of their severity and you have to prevent the complications which I have just mentioned. Now let's move on to the further specific measures uh, of treatment that is after you investigate and establish the cause of nephrotic syndrome in these patients we need to look into these measures like a blanket therapy to reduce the salt in this patient it's less than 5 grams per day of table salt or sodium chloride and we need to give them diuretics thiazide or frosamide like frosamide up to 120 milligram per day but cautiously and you may have to add on potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone. The protein intake need to be normal as 1 gram or 1.5 gram per kg body weight. Infusion of albumin is done only in patients who are resistant to the optimal diuretic therapy. And whenever they have oliguria and uremia, and also in the absence of severe glomerular damage, we need to combine the infusion of human albumin with the diuretic therapy. A minimal change in glomerular lesion is established diagnosis or as a cause of nephrotic syndrome. In them, we straight away have to start the patient on real high dose corticosteroids, prednisolone 60 mg per meter square body surface area for 8 weeks. And we see a beautiful response of more than 95% in childhood or children. Um, in adults, the response rate is much less longer duration, like 20 to 24 weeks, the treatment will be required. Then only we can get a higher percentage of response. The relapse is in almost 50% of patients on withdrawal of steroids. Then we need to repeat the course of steroids. And after remission with steroid therapy, we need to give a course of other potent immunosuppressants like cyclophosphamide, 2 to 3 mg per kg daily for 6 to 8 weeks or alternative drug which can be used is cyclosporine. And now membranous nephropathy. If membranous nephropathy is established diagnosed by the renal biopsy, the role of steroids, cyclophosphamide and azathioprine are controversial. Only one third of the patients develop end stage renal failure, one third will develop spontaneous remission. Those who are having massive proteinuria and progressive renal impairment do benefit from the treatment. And you need to look into the other causes which lead to membranous nephropathy on histopathology. They are like SLE and they have to treat them with steroid as a first line and then we go on to cyclophosphamide or azotheprine and they are able to produce a long term remission in these patients. Now how to treat the complications whether they are acute or chronic. Like acute complications like venous thrombosis, we need to put the patient on anticoagulant therapy and we need to mobilize them so they need not be on prolonged bed rest. And in the absence of contraindications, prophylactic anticoagulation also is preferred at times. And sepsis, we need an early detection and very aggressive therapy of sepsis. 
and we need to give pneumococcal vaccination as prophylaxis. Dyslipidemia at times is so severe, we need to put them on HMG coir reductase inhibitors or statins. Oliguric renal failure, as I said, we need to cautiously give albumin infusion plus mannitol or any other potent diuretic. Now let's move on to diabetic nephropathy. This is one of the major uh, cause of secondary nephrotic syndrome in our continent. And, it, and we all know that it's a leading cause of end-stage renal disease globally. It affects 30% of type 1 diabetes mellitus and as high as 20% of type 2 diabetics. Initially, there will be a nephromegaly, then progression to microalbuminuria, which you cannot detect in the dipstick. And that will slowly progress to diabetic nephropathy and chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease eventually. In most of the patients, renal biopsy is not required for diagnosis and all the other treatable cause of renal disease should be excluded in when you consider diabetic nephropathy as a diagnosis. The risk factors are poor control of the blood sugar for many many years and the long duration of diabetes mellitus itself and presence of other microvascular complications like retinopathy. Racially, Asians, Pima Indians are more prone to go into diabetic nephropathy very faster and pre-existing essential hypertension in these patients and family history of diabetic nephropathy, family history of essential hypertension increases the risk. And we need to look into the microalbuminuria as I had said. This is defined as 30 to 300 milligram of albumin per day in the urine. Okay, This is the definition of microalbuminuria. As I have already said, this will not give a positive dipstick, albustics test. Or it can also take it in micrograms per milligram of creatinine in the spot urine collection. It's a very important predictor for progression towards overt proteinuria and renal failure in type 1 diabetics. And it's a marker of microvascular damage and progression to renal failure in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Let's come to the pathology of this very common nephropathy. There will be a basic pathology of globular basement membrane thickening and we have a classical lesion called Kimmelstein Wilson nodule. It's an expansion of the mesangium due to accumulation of extracellular matrix, eosinophilic granules and periodic acid schiff nodules. All this produce an elevation and that's why we call it nodular glomerulosclerosis. And in additionally there will be glomerular hyalinosclerosis, then hyalin deposition will be there and that causes thickening of the glomeruli. If microscopy is done, it, there will be IgG deposition along with glomerular basement membrane in a linear pattern. You all can have a look at this. So now we have the uh, slide here, histopathological slide. The arrow mark is showing the cable still will sit, show further pictures. So here you can see a depiction of the glomerulus and you have all the different labeling here and uh, this is how a intact glomerulus looks with this apparatus. And now we all know the special functions of the glomerulus especially when it comes to the immunity also. So here I have labeled different functions and their abnormal illnesses like if you are talking about immune complex the diseases which afflict the kidney should be cryoglobulinemia, serum sickness and endocarditis. So it goes like this and here good pastures syndrome or disease, globular basement membrane thickening, podocyte loss can be there in membranous nephropathy. Now diabetic nephropathy, how does it progress? As I said, it slowly starts with uh, microalbuminuria and then becomes overt proteinuria. It almost takes two decades and 30% of them will have proteinuria or other evidence of nephropathy. Usually it's associated with malignant vasculopathy. We are talking about the afferent and reflect arterioles here and other vascular complications. And a similar incidence in type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus will occur and this is related to the duration of diabetes as such in both. As I said, glomerulosclerosis is the hallmark where they are given a name called as Kimmel-Steel-Wilson disease. Diffuse glomerulosclerosis 
is most common. Nodular glomerulosclerosis has already been shown to you and it is present in a minority of patients.